ancestry. Um, so, you know, in my travels, I've been blessed to connect with a wide variety of people who work in liberation spaces for people of African ancestry. Um, over the last 10 years, uh, that, that family has expanded to those who do earthwork. And when I say earthwork, I mean these are people who are farmers, who are gardeners, who are seed savers, who are outdoor educators, who are uh, conservationists, who are you know, environmentalists. These are folks that are overtly, intentionally, and deliberately connecting their narrative to the land, right? And the planet that upon which we uh, find ourselves. So, you know, it's important for us to see a variety of narratives in this space, uh, contemporary, uh, 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 mainstream uh, will have you believe that people of ancestry, people of African ancestry, don't care about the land, right? Or are not involved in environmental uh, justice or stewardship work or even in agriculture, right? But what I've experienced is that couldn't be further from the truth, right? Um, so the first person I like to bring up to the stage with me is a. a Amazing young man that I've met within the last uh, six months, uh, brother uh, Michael Carter from uh, Virginia State University Small Farm Outreach. I give it up for Michael Carter. All right, um, and then I have another brother that I've crossed paths with um, in my travels up and down Highway 95. Um, brother named Xavier Brown. Xavier, are you around? Who are you at? Hi, my brother Xavier Brown uh, from Soil Generation, Black Dirt Collective, and a bunch of other things. I'm gonna let him introduce himself. So, is she here? Okay, and we got some other folks that are joining us um, as they walk in. Um, so, what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna let y'all introduce yourselves because I do horrible jobs at introducing people. I have things that I feel are important, but <laughs> I'd rather folks introduce themselves. So Michael, I'm gonna give it to you. And the first question I'm gonna ask you, um, after you introduce yourself, tell people who you are, where you work, and what kind of work you do. Uh, let people know, or at least imagine or take a moment to think back to what your earliest memory of being outdoors was and what that meant to you. Is that good? All right, let's do it. Good evening. How's everybody? But first, I'd like to give all honor and praise to the Creator, the ancestors, the bunch of soldiers who stand. Uh, without them, we wouldn't have no us. Uh, my name is Michael Carter, Jr. with Virginia State University Small Farm I Reach Program. Uh, I'm like a 13th generation farmer. Uh, my people farm, and then all my sisters' records and slave documents I've discovered say my people farm, and my people farm in Africa, and it's what we do. Uh, my first experience with agriculture, my father's an agriculture teacher. So I started out in the womb with the seed planting in me. Uh, my godfather's an agriculture teacher. His father was an agriculture professor. Uh, so when I first, my first experience with that agriculture and soil, I hated it. <laughs> I absolutely oppose and dislike the sweat, dirty hands, the sweat, the not being able to play basketball with your friends because you got to go pick things and plant seeds. And so I absolutely despise it. I told myself I would never, never <laughs> be an agriculture. And uh, I lied to myself. <laughs> so that's my first experience with it. Nah, I mean, when it's in your soul, when it's in your genes, when it's in your cells, you can't get away from it. No matter what you have tried to do, whatever you've done, try to do, you can't get away from it. So that's my first experience with agriculture and soil. Thank you. Yeah, I gave it up for my car. Uh, greetings, everybody. Ron, thanks for having me come down here. My name is Xavier Brown. I'm from D.C. I'm part of the Black Dirt Farm Collective. Um, we're some of the creators of Afroecology. 
as a uh, as a concept. Um, I'm also the founder of an organization in DC called Soulful City, and um, another organization called South East. And so, what's your question? Again? Just tell us a little bit about yourself, but in the context of your earliest memory of being outdoors and what that meant for you. For sure. Um, my earliest memories of being outdoors. I saw from DC. I went to North Carolina A and T. Aggie Pride. Yeah, yeah, definitely Aggie Pride. Um, uh, you know, um, I, I try to keep my bias. When I'm from DC, I went to A and T, and I'm a fellow with the Robin Wood Johnson Foundation, and I'm a member of Black Bear Farm Collective. Uh, some of my uh, earliest memories of being outside. Um, my father used to always take us on like these these long hikes through the park, parks in D.C., like Rock Creek Park, and we would just be walking around for hours and hours. So those are like some of my earliest memories of him taking me out, maybe some of my cousins or some of my friends with the dog, and we just just go through walking and picking up stuff, you know, finding stuff, just exploring and things of that nature. So my um, love for the outdoors, my love for nature, my love for like the natural ecology, just the D.C., um, it's always been very rooted in me. And getting back into agriculture later on down the line kind of brought that back up because the, the kind of the natural landscape of DC is kind of a, a city that's built inside of, of many, you know, parks and forts that were kind of created during the Civil War. And so every part of DC is kind of touching different trees. And, you know, the Anacostia River, Cushion City, the Potomac River's right there, Chesapeake Bay's right there. So um, those are some of my arguments. Um, give it up for you. Um, so to spark this conversation, you know, one of the things that I, you know I, I find very important uh, for me, especially for you know younger folks coming up underneath, is having an understanding as to why agriculture is important, specifically to people of African ancestry. Um, you know, I, I hate to I hate to always start a conversation with slavery, and it's it's problematic. You know, with my earliest part, my earliest experiences with uh, organizing. You know, people would tell me, "Oh, folks, black folks don't want to have nothing to do with the dirt because of slavery." You know, and I, and, I, and for me, you know, it never registered that you know I should not be doing this because of slavery. It was a different experience. I came in it from a liberatory practice, right? So. Uh, I guess the question that I have for you is from your interpretation, from your point of view and perspective, what makes agriculture, what makes uh, regeneration uh, uh, important and why is it important specifically for people of African ancestry? That's a great question and uh, you know, I don't think we understand our history enough in terms of who we are and what we did. Uh, if you go back to our earliest existence on the planet, somewhere in Africa, who we were farmers. Agriculture, you know, the first person that's documented in the Bible was a gardener. You know, uh, Adam, he worked a farm. He wasn't a lawyer, he wasn't a banker, he wasn't a president. He worked in the garden. And if the creator decided that this individual should be doing this, then what more of it is us to think any different? You know, as we go throughout history, you know, either the Bible, the Quran, uh, the book of the coming forth by day and by night. Our streams and our empires were built around agriculture. We learned about the Nile Valley civilization and the rise and fall of the Nile River. And in that rise and fall of the Nile River, they built gigantic civilizations based upon what? Agriculture. And as we move throughout Africa, we've always found that agriculture was always our strength. And even when we got to this point of, or this part of the egg of our story, in terms of the enslavement and kidnapping of Africans, they picked up agriculturists. You know, the melt of soil we moved during South, during uh, making rice mounds in South Carolina was equivalent to that of the Great Pyramid. So we were still moving earth, still creating in and of itself. And this country is built upon agriculture. So if you think about all the early agricultural benefits of this country, sugarcane, cotton, tobacco, they were all, you know, people profited from us. It's just that because we didn't profit from it as African Americans or African descent, we don't just say see the value of it. And for this next generation, as we're coming up of age, we're looking at, you know, hemp and marijuana legislation coming up, and we out the game because we don't want to do agriculture. 
And so you're buying it to somebody else who don't look like you, but you're not growing it. You're going to jail for it, but you're not growing it. I mean, I, I don't know anybody who has went to jail for wrong me. <laughs> I've seen a whole lot of folks get caught with selling it. But where do you think the money really comes from? Does it come from selling it or from growing it? You know, and now it's legal, who's going to take advantage of that? You know, so we have to really step in the space and really make agriculture much more attractive. We don't realize how much, you know, from the rubber on your tires to all the chocolate you consume come from African agriculture. Uh, cotton, all those things come from African agriculture. So you can't see the value of, of agriculture. We really don't have eyes to see it, don't have really a good understanding of our history and our story in general. That from the beginning of time, we've been growing food. Now we want to get to a point now we think more intelligent. So we don't need to grow food anymore. That's absurd. At this point in time, we need to be growing more and more food, more food now than ever before. And if we don't do it, we're gonna find ourselves truly dependent upon other people. That's been our saving grace coming out of enslavement period. What's the first thing our people did was get land and start growing food to be able to support themselves. And we've gotten so dependent upon other cultures that we really have neglected what has kept us alive and thriving in this country since we've been here. Hold on, hold on. So, uh, so, yeah. so uh, as I said, as uh, some other folks that are going to be jumping on the panel with us. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I want to, you know, make a quick introduction, or at least allow them to introduce yourselves. I have uh, Trina Baxter here with me from Soil Four Generation. Uh, and then I also have. Uh, Brother Stanley Morgan uh, from Black Dirt Collective as well. Uh, so I'm gonna switch seats with you, so you can get right here, right? I'm just gonna do that, and I'm gonna move around a little bit so we can pass this mic. Uh, the introduction question was just tell people who you are, you know what it is you do, and remember, or at least think about and then articulate what was your earliest memory or is your earliest memory of being out of doors and why it resonated with you. Peace. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> all right, um, so the question, oh, uh, all right, peace, everybody. My name is Stanley Morgan, as the brother said, uh, from Black Dirt Farm Collective. Uh, we are, regional collective of land lovers, farmers, activists, scientists, teachers, all of that. Um, so yeah, so to answer the question, my earliest memory as a child being outside, it had to be, um, I remember about four years old, being in uh, Pampers, at my grandma's house uh, and being told to like go outside, just, just go outside, have some fun, and get out of grown folks' business. <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, you know, we found the nearest park for playing. I remember basketball, I remember, you know, just uh, just playing around the uh, playground, parks. Yeah. What was the last? Was that the question? Right. Yeah, so what was your earliest and why it resonated with you? Being outside, what was it about being outside? Right, so being out, what resonated with me being outside is just the fact that, uh, I don't know, it's just, it just felt like I felt free, like I could do anything. Yeah, when I was told to be to go outside, you know, at first it was just like, ah, eh, without y'all, by myself. But when I was, you know, after being out there and making friends and, uh, you know, just just being familiar with the environment and, and who lives there, it just uh, it felt it felt free. It felt like okay, okay. Can you hear me now? All right. 
<laughs> so yeah, it, it, felt, it felt free. I mean, just being able to, you know, bust it up with the homies and not be in a supervision of uh, my parents or anything <laughs> at four. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, yeah, just even though I wasn't really leaving the block, you know what I mean? Just, just being outside with friends. Yeah. All right, so my name is Katrina Baxter, and I'm here from Philadelphia. This is my partner Stan and my brother Xavier, and all three of us are in Black Bear Farm Collective. So the three of us are a part of Black Bear Farm Collective, and we do Afroecology and Agroecology Encounters, which is farmer-to-farmer -farmer training for black folks and brown folks on the land in Maryland. And so we've been doing that together for about four years. Um, I also, we also, both of us are belong to a coalition called Soil Generation in Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, we um, organize black farmers in the city uh, to, to come together and share resources and do political education. And we also um, for policy in the city. Um, we, do, we, we do a lot of work around access to land for black folks because, as you know, in most cities, we don't, you know, we, we, have, we have a lot of folks been growing, we've been growing for decades in the city, but we don't actually have ownership of that land or collective, or in a collective way or anyway. And so a lot of our, a lot of our farms or our gardens in the city of Philadelphia are on, um, or on land that is not owned by the folks who are working the land. So that's a lot of the work that we do. And so my first experience on the land I don't think that I can remember my first experience in the land. I actually grew up in the suburbs, so there was a lot of, you know, so we had grass, and we had, um, and every, I remember when I was a child, every yard had a fruit tree in it, right? And, um, and di a different, like, you know, someone had a grapevine, and someone had, but I think by the time I was in middle school, all of them were gone, you know? And, and it was interesting to me how, how little we cared, and how little we valued what we had. And I think a lot of the folks were homeowners, and they just didn't want to, deal with bees and cleaning up the, you know, it was such a, because it was such a task, just one tree. But the majority of those, of, of us come from agrarian backgrounds, right? And we had, a, we had orchards and, you know, my family actually grew up, my family is from Goochland, which is about 60 miles from here. So my great, great grandfather had a farm and, um, and he had a huge orchard and everyone in the town, you know, sort of coexisted in a way where it was two farmers and two farms, two folks, two, two families who had a lot of land help everyone else in the community, right? So those are sort of what we're trying to get back to now when we're re-agrarianizing the, the movement of young people who are coming into farming, we're going into farming now. So my first experience, I guess, on the land was, you know, was as a child, but that just stayed with me throughout my life. So uh, the question that uh, y'all jumped in when y'all came in, we were on, was uh, why do we feel, what, or why do you feel agriculture is important and why is it important to reconnect, you know, people of African ancestry to, you know, agriculture, to regeneration, to, you know, ecology in, in a very intentional and deliberate way? Yeah, so um, I believe that uh, agriculture is important for all folks, and most importantly, the black folks, because uh, that's our source, right? That connects us back to the land, that, that allows us to remember why we are here, where we come from. Um, it gives us a clear understanding on, you know, uh, some, of, some of the ways we learn to be by, you know, uh, understanding how nature and um, the land that we, that we, that we stand on is um, working, you know what I mean? So I feel like it's a, it's a uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a uh, ancestral knowledge that, that us all as Africans need, you know, to, to, to you know, to press on to, uh, to survive in, the, in this realm right here. Yeah, it was good. I appreciate what the gentleman was saying. I was coming in, the brother was talking, and everything you said spoke to me, right? So understanding that, um, that as, as agrarian people, um, historically, we've been, as you said, growing land. And, you know, one of the things that I like to talk about all the time is that women created agriculture, right? So women who were herds and homekeepers, who were watching the, watching the plants grow every year and watching the seed fall and were able to, to understand that actually this thing happens all the time. Maybe it makes sense if I take this and put it here, this will grow as well. So agriculture came from women, black women from Africa to be very specific. And so that is something that I need to make sure that I say in every, every 
every time that I speak, so that we're understanding that this is something that's a part of us, part of our history and a part of our culture, and that we should be, and that we should be honoring that part of our culture. And, and so one of the things that I think is really important when we talk about the reconnection to land is because um, our experience in this country um, through enslavement has caused us to be disconnected to have had, we, we've had a, 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 a troublesome relationship with the land, right? So in one way, the land has caused us a lot of trauma, right? And in another way, we also know that the land is part of our healing. So I think that with understanding that the complexity of which we live in this and exist in this country, and also the complexity of the relationship that we have with land, is a really important thing for us to, to hold up as we go back onto the land, and also to honor when we're thinking about what is the, what, the work it is that we're doing on the land, right? So we are trying to reconnect to our ancestors, to our lineage, and to, um, and to the things that make us whole, um, which we already know, like, you know, now there's like all these studies that say if you put your hands in the soil, you heal. But I think we knew that already, right? And, and sometimes, we, I work with young people over the years, and, and you know, first, the first thing they say when, they, when we try to bring them on the farm is like, nah, I'm not messing with no dirt, and I don't want to see no bugs, no worms. And literally within weeks of working on the ground, their whole attitude, you know, their whole behavior towards the thing has changed because they didn't realize, even without even knowing, there's healing in the soil, right? So there, there's so much to gain from just putting your hands in the soil alone that um, the organizing that comes along in the spaces that we're on contribute to that political education. What they learn and how they connect to their, um, to their ancestral lineage is a part of all the growing that happens on the urban farms that we have and, the, and also the rural farmers that I know, small farmers that I know who are, who are farming the land in a certain way. So I think that we understand the, the enormity actually of the importance of us going back to land and also of our disconnection from land as we've migrated north, um, as black folks as we migrated north and sort of having that distance even more so. Now people are realizing and remembering that my grandmother had a garden. And you know what, we, had, we did have tomatoes and she did used to make me go out there and pick, the, and pick green beans and, or, shuck pe or shuck peas. And, and we remember, and as we remember that, you know, that comes back for me, it has been a, a, a revival of, um, of understanding who I am as a person um, with regards to my heritage, but also with regards to my, my humanness, right? And how, how important it is for us as living beings to be interconnected on the earth in so many different ways and so many lessons that we get through the, through the, through the soil and through working the soil. So I'm ever grateful, you know, for the heritage that I carry and for the ancestors who were able to bring me forth um, to, to this point here now where we're all celebrating what it is to be re-agrarianized in the land. Good. Just to, I guess, to close it out, I think they kind of summed it up pretty well. With some, some two quotes that uh, that came up with what Katrina they brought up with me. There's an elder in D.C. named Bob Odunu, who's a tall guy, he's like six seven, six six. It's like seventy, maybe like seventy years old. But a quote that I, I guess everybody would attribute to him. Um, is that there's no culture without agriculture. And he always says that, and he always, you know, takes time to kind of reinforce that to you if you're in the, the black agrarian space in D.C., PG County, Maryland, Northern Virginia. And so, um, you know, what you said brought that up with me. Also, another member of our collective named Shakira, something else you said, she said, she, had, she told me, she said it one time, and I thought it was brilliant, but she said that, um, you know, during the enslavement of, of, of Africans in this country, we confused what happened to us on the land with the land itself, you know? And so, um, just through that experience and that trauma, you know, we, we made that separation. And I think now, like in this kind of current moment that we're in, there's people that are coming back, you know, and, and building those bridges and are uh, really healing uh, a lot of ancestral traumas that have been, you know, that have happened to us on the land and our, our kind of movement and migration away from the land. So um, it's, it's definitely important. I, I don't think I can really add too much to what everybody else has said, but there's definitely a movement uh, going on. I think Afroecology um, and everybody here that, that works in the land kind of embodies Afroecology. And I think that is um, a lot of times in history, kind of like what the brother was saying, there's so much history that folks has never talked to us and we have to kind of dig ourselves, whether it's with rice, whether it's with architecture, all these people that, you know, um, there's a book that said, like the transatlantic slave trade was probably the biggest 
uh, intellectual and technology transfer that ever happened, right? Because there's so many, we, we think just people came on the boats, but these are doctors, these are farmers, architects, all types of people came, you know, and they're bringing that knowledge with them. And, and they're transferring that knowledge and applying it here. And so they're, they're completely shifting and changing the, the landscape of, of, of uh, what we call North America and the Caribbean and all that type of stuff. So there's so much history, and I think with Afroecology, what we're doing is like really defining ourselves and defining our experience. I don't want to say for the first time ever, but for the first time that I know that, you know, defining it and sharing it, and just through technology and the way we're able to connect now, we can kind of blast it out to so many people, and people are able to kind of connect with uh, the definition of Afroecology, and maybe, I guess, somebody can read it too. If people aren't familiar with the definition of Afroecology, that would probably be good uh, for context. So uh, we're going to circle back around to, uh, to defining Afroecology in a minute. Um, but I still, I want to, I'm, I'm really, narratives are important to me, right? Because each individual comes with their own unique narrative and their own story, right? And, you know, your story is as unique as your DNA, right? Um, but it's through story that we inspire others and people see themselves in our stories, right? Um, so. You know, earlier when I opened up, I kind of told a little bit about my story and how I got into this work as it relates to, you know, uh, farming, gardening, food systems, you know, that it, it was rooted in this cultural identity work first. And then kind of by accident, I almost say by fate, you know, I ended up digging in the soil, right? Um, but I want to um, get your, uh, like, what brought you to this work? I want to hear. And I think the audience would uh, be uh, blessed to hear what brought you to this space. Like, how did you get into a space of being an agriculturalist or an earth worker? Like, what got you there? Like, what, what what inspired it? Like, who touched you? Who reached out to you? Who put you underneath the wing? Like, what pulled you into that space? Well, I definitely think uh, you know family plays a big role in it. And again, it's my genetics. Um, but you know, I can recall my fathers, my uncles, uh, everybody that I knew was agriculturalist. Uh, you know, I would say what brought me back home to back to Virginia, because I was in Ghana, West Africa for five years. I came back for a visit last year, and they told me or expressed to me what my grandfather did to acquire our land. But I had a story I'd never heard before. Uh, and like many of us, you know, our perceptions of our grandparents are based upon you know, what we see. I only saw him with a liquor bottle and snuff. So he was cussing or drinking at any point, every time, any time I've seen him. Uh, up until his diabetes and his legs cut off, there's a bottle right beside him. All the way to the he went. But he's a World War II vet. And apparently, uh, he got drafted to go to World War II at 18 years old, him and two brothers. and. In their wisdom, in their lack of education, they sent back their World War II checks to my great-grandmother to buy the land, 185 acres. Sacrifice, and, you know, and then you know, understand his story and his trauma. He, he buried individuals in the war. You know, he wasn't an infantry guy, he just dealt with dead bodies for two years. Burying individuals day after day, not knowing that was gonna be your brother, that you're gonna have to bury, you know. And, you know, his story, touched me to make me say, okay, I gotta come back home. And really help, <laughs> I can't deal with this. I mean, and then hearing even more about his story, yeah. in 1968, April 1st, 1968, him and his brother, after they acquired the land with their, with the money that they acquired from the World War II, um, he died on the track, on the farm. You know what I'm saying? And having to deal with that, that trauma, and I can see why he ended up, you know, self-medicating himself so much because of the trauma of the land, but also keeping the land, making sure that we had the land. Uh, that story there inspired me to come home and make sure that I maintain that legacy. You know, for all that he sacrificed to acquire the land, I don't understand how you, you, you in war and you sacrifice your entire paycheck and, uh, to make sure that you have something for your family. You know, and, and that's a tremendous respect I have had toward him and his sacrifice. And for my father and my uncles and all that to maintain it, uh, and they were looking for somebody to pass it on to, and I was like, okay. 
<laughs> I, I can't not do it. Thanks for that story, Rick. Um, how I found agriculture is uh, a little different. Um, so uh, most of my family that I know of, uh, I was, uh, I, was I, I embody the, tr the troubled child uh, uh, identity. So I, yeah, I was a troubled child for a long time. And um, I wound up uh, going away in 2012 uh, for some troubles that I did. <laughs> and, um, and coming home, I was, I was uh, eager to change my life and get involved with some uh, something a, a little more uh, relatable than, than, than what I was doing and what, that I w thought I wanted to do. So uh, once I got home, I immediately got involved in like this reentry program to uh, try to better my life in, this, in, 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 in some way. So uh, after uh, the reentry program led me to this uh, miracle program that was uh, called uh, Power Core, and it was like beautification of my city, helping to uh, clean up some of the invasive uh, trees and plants that were living in the area. And it gave me a chance to uh, learn about different uh, plant species and learn about uh, some of the, the uh, issues that was happening in my neighborhood and my community. So as I started to learn and hear about some of these issues, uh, it, sparked, it sparked something in me to want to you know, get involved and help a little, a little more than what I've been doing. So um, I, found the, uh, I found the farm that, uh, that I grew up near. So when I was younger, the farm wasn't there when I was younger, but uh, once, once I got into the reentry program and started changing my life, I revisited my, my old neighborhood and it was like a farm down the street from where I used to grow up at. And that, that wound up being the farm that I uh, wound up uh, uh, being a fellowship at for, for six months. And then the next six months I became the farm manager. And um, as I was uh, working and learning about the different roles of a farm manager, um, I was able to meet uh, beautiful people that was uh, sharing with me about my, my history, my, my history as a, a black man, and a black person here in America, and how it ties to uh, some of the things I was doing around agriculture and um, being, being this voice and this uh, advocate for my community. So um, I was all in. And um, from there, uh, I met Black Third, the Soil Generation, and just more folks that were of a like mind that also wanted to um, support me and me to support them in changing this. Thank you. So, uh, so he and I worked in the same farm for the last three years. And so for me, um, so my story is the spiritual nature. So about 25 years ago, um, when I was sort of like, you know, trying to figure out um, where where I wanted to go spiritually, what path I wanted to be on, growing up um, in a Christian household, not really feeling like that was um, that was speaking to me as an adult, um, searching for something different, and what I found was earth-based religion, is what I call it, um, or earth-based spirituality, and I think, and, and so at that point when I understood um, how to the reality of everything in the, in the cosmos and the universe, and, but then how connected we all are to everything in the cosmos and the, uni in the universe, and then how the Earth itself, herself, um, is, a, is a mirror, right, of all the goodness that's in the universe. Um, I, I understood that, that was the path that was for me, and so as I, as I journeyed my path, um, I say Jesus introduced me to his mother. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. And, <laughs> And so, as, as my journey went forward, and, and I've always sort of been, I've always been radical, like a radical mind, because I've always had radical politics. So, you know, in thinking about what are, you know, what are, what is the fight I'm going to fight for? And you know, uh, the black community is riddled with all the isms that happen in, 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 you know, in America. They are also, you know, choosing a path to be important for me because there's so many things we can work on. We find ourselves divided and not being able to really fully do one thing. 
what, 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 what spoke to me is that actually the basis of all of the isms is land, right? It's people's, people's ability to not have land, people's desire to want land, people's, you know, so in every way, the, the, the resources that are on the land, the resources that, that are in the land, are all the things that make up the isms that we're dealing with in the society. And so it makes sense to me that I would work towards causes that would fight for land. And so that has been my journey for the last 20 something years because that's what I understood for myself as a young person. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for me, uh, I guess it's about like seven, eight years ago now, um, I was living in North Carolina at the time. I lost my job, so I moved back home to DC. And I really wasn't doing to move back home and move back home with my folks. I wasn't doing too much of anything. I was like just going to the go-go every night. I was partying every night. And, um, um, you know, one day, my dad, he woke me up early in the morning on like a, it's like a Saturday morning. I had gone out there, I had a hangover. I went out the night before. He was like, man, come with me to plant these trees. I was like, all right, let's do it. I'm, I'm gonna come and roll with it. So we went to plant these trees with this organization in DC called Casey Trees. And all they do is plant trees around the city, reforest, kind of, uh, you know, reforest the, uh, the city. And so kind of through that process, you know, he and I was like the only black dudes there. It's all white people there. And this is like the time I just started realizing that like, DC was really changing. Because when I was growing up in DC, it was called Chocolate City. So, I mean, he had already recognized it, but for me, I wasn't really conscious of like, because I was still moving and growing, doing my thing. But that really kind of brought it to me. It's like, dang, we like, we were in Northeast DC plant trees. And it was like, me and him, I'm two black guys. So it really kind of like, it brought up some emotions in me. And, and, and simultaneously around that time, one of my friends, uh, we started an organization called the Green Scheme, uh, a, a nonprofit that still exists. And he was asking, he was like, man, come, come in, you know, start this with me, you know. And I, I didn't have a job, I wasn't doing anything, so I was like, let's do it. And, um, you know, that happened. Uh, I ended up taking DC Master Garden class, just like trying, and then I, then I, I, I would say, like, it, it kind of got, got into me. You know, I didn't really get into farm, it got into me. You know, and then I just started kind of following that spirit, and I just started meeting. I met Trina along the way, I think at like a Seed Keepers Collective. I met Stan at Agri Ecology Encounter. And I just started meeting other people, like so many other people. And, and um, it really just was like, it was beautiful, you know what I mean? Because it really like, it was like the first time I felt like I was like a part of something that was like bigger than myself. It was, you know, positive. You know, it was like, um, for me, and it's probably like that, like I was able to go and I, I used to do a whole bunch of gardens and different parts of DC, places where nobody would even go to, but like, it was almost like a free pass to go to different neighborhoods, and because you're doing something positive, nobody's like sick, all that's to do who gardens with my son. They might be like hustling or something, but this dude like gardens with my son, so I like, he's a good dude, you know? So we were like, so it was kind of um, that type of spirit, and I was just like rolling with that spirit. Um, so that's pretty much it, just to keep it short, you know. And I've just been like riding, pretty much riding that same, just following that spirit, that energy to this day, you know what I'm saying? I guess probably everybody else is doing the same thing. Probably. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, you brought up Baba Aduno. So, uh, you know, Baba Aduno is a legend. So, Tariq, uh, Aduno Tariq uh, is uh, a Garvey right? And in 2003, when I started uh, Happily Natural Day, uh, I joined the UNIA, ACL, uh, uh, the Gabriel Prosser Division here in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I was joined, you know, an elder took me under the, under the wing. And one of the things, we would go to DC, right? Uh, it was the closest, like, that's where headquarters or where, you know, the seat of all the, you know, real activity was happening, closest to us in a way. So, um, you know, I remember when I met Oduna, and his first, you know, his conversation with me about 4-H and, you know, starting gardens, and this is like this dude that played basketball, he's like, you know, but his claim to fame is like, you know, letting people know how important it is to grow, to grow plants, you know, and he's a towering figure. Like, you know, you look up to him, like, in a literal sense, as well as like a, a you know, energy sense, right? So, um, I never forget him, like, telling me, like, oh yeah, there's no culture without agriculture. And then, what's amazing about that is, like, I go other places and people have met Baba Oduna, right? 
I went to I went to Atlanta, and the brothers in Atlanta was like Bob Oduno. I was like, yo, I went to Harlem, and the brothers in Harlem was like Bob Oduno. I was like, yo, this is a, you know, he's like 70 something years old, but it, I mean, everybody that I met had a Bob Oduno story. Yeah. <laughs> so I just think that's deep, and it, it, it's it's interesting how that weaves, you know, how this uh, intergenerational. Conversation we is woven, you know, through this uh, dialogue. Um, so, you know, building on that, I, I kind of feel like our work or the work of regeneration, the work of uh, 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 earth work, of working the earth, of working with soil, is synonymous with like institution building, right? Because um, in a way, you know, we're building a new, we, we build new realities, you know, every season when we plant or we carve out a new garden or a new farm or we plant a new tree, it's like we're building a new reality. So I wanted to ask, um, how, how do you see, you know, your work in the context of building like alternative institutions, right, um, as, as a, uh, you know, I use the word activist upon myself because I've, you know, before activists got the person of the year, like, we was out here, like, in the streets doing work. Um, so I still, I hold that, like, yeah, we really do that work, but it's not in the same context as, like, I'm just gonna protest problems, right? Um, not to dissuade anyone from protesting problems, but there's an additional layer. Um, which I consider to be the building of the reality against, the building of a new reality that exists separate and apart from the reality in which you protest, right? Um, so how do you interpret, you know, your work in, through the lens of institution building is, is the question, right? And, you know, I'm springing this on you, Michael, I know you're like, man, you should have told me this before. But, <laughs> but um, I, I really want to kind of frame you know, this work of, uh, you know, farming and agrarianism and agronomy and horticulture, you know, in the context, firmly in the context of self-determination. And I think uh, you can't talk about self-determination if you're not talking about building institutions. 